Hello and good evening. How you guys doing? Great. Awesome. Well, I'm excited about this amazing uh, conversation over cocktails about the arts of diplomacy. My name is Michael Henderson, and I'm representing the Future Forum uh, Board of Directors. So if you are a board member, if you can wave your hand uh, forward. Awesome. I want to also thank our sponsors. Uh, the Downtown Austin Alliance, as well as the FVF Law Firm. The Future Forum's events are made possible by our amazing and incredible members, um, as well as our sponsors. By a show of hands, is this your first Future Forum event? Awesome. Well, I keep saying Future Forum, but let me explain really what the Future Forum is. It, we bring together individuals from different backgrounds, experiences, and points of view to discuss local, statewide, national, and international topics that affect us today. Our goal is to create civil, informed, and bipartisan discussions. With that in mind, please respect, be respectful of our visitors and our speakers tonight. We all have opinions, right? And uh, here is a stage and here is a platform to celebrate those. Um, if you're not a member, I, before you leave, I strongly encourage you to see what the Future Forum has to offer. I am excited and honored to hear from my guest today, uh, Mr. Pablo uh, Marentes. He serves as the general counsel of Mexico based here in Austin. So, bienvenidos. If you join me, give him a round of applause. Viva Mexico. Viva Mexico. In addition, I uh, wanted to introduce to everyone Mr. Richard Hyde. He's the Council General of the United Kingdom based in Houston. Well, well, well. And moderating today's discussion is Ms. Adriana Cruz. I'm so excited because I feel like my career has come full circle. <laughs> About five or six years ago when I first moved back from Texas after school from Washington, uh, a gentleman in the audience by the name of Aaron Demerson said that I should have coffee uh, with Adriana. Fast forward a few years later, and now I'm at the podium introducing her and continuing our conversation started many years ago. Uh, she serves as the Executive Director of Economic Development of Tourism in Governor Greg Abbott's office. Um, Last but not least, after our discussion, we're gonna have time for question and answers. So remember that questions end in a question mark, so this is not a time for statements, <laughs> but we wanna give you that platform to do that. And with that, now I'll turn our discussion over to Ms. Adriana Cruz to moderate this discussion. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Michael, and it's wonderful to see you again, and we've come full circle. Um, thank you so much, and uh, it's great to be here with you. It's an honor uh, to be on the stage with these two distinguished gentlemen and diplomats from two extraordinarily important countries um, for the state of Texas. Uh, and as stated, my name is Adriana Cruz. I'm the Executive Director of the Economic Development and Tourism Office in the office of Governor Abbott. Um, and uh, we're going to get started. Texas has an incredibly strong and growing economic and cultural relationship with both Mexico and the United Kingdom. Um, and I'm gonna go over a quick bio uh, of our two um, guests just to give you all some idea of their experience and their background. Um, uh, Pablo Marentes was appointed by President Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador to serve as the Consul General of Mexico in Austin since July 2019. Uh, the Consul holds a law degree graduated from the National Autonomous University of Mexico, UNAM. Uh, he is a professor at the Faculty of Political Science of UNAM, as well as other universities. And Consul Marentes has extensive experience in media, including as a collaborator for journals, print, media, television, and radio. He has held the following positions, Minister in Charge of Cultural Affairs at the Mexican Embassy in Washington, the Consul General of Mexico in New York, the Consul General of Mexico in San Francisco, and he is the author of several books and articles regarding the social effects of communication, political parties, and the history of public television in Mexico. And uh, Richard Hyde 
commenced his position as Her Majesty's Consul General in Houston in June 2019. So both of you started in 2019. As Consul General, he has responsibilities for leading the UK's engagement in the states of Oklahoma, Texas, Arkansas, Louisiana, and New Mexico, but we know which one is your favorite. No comment. Um, no comment. His priorities and responsibilities include developing political ties between the UK and the consular district, enhancing trade and investment partnerships, promoting science and innovation links, and supporting the delivery of consular services. Um, as a career diplomat, Consul Hyde has served in a range of positions around the world, including in Caracas, Venezuela, and San Jose, Costa Rica. So the Espanol está más o menos bien, sí, más o menos. Um, the head of advanced manufacturing investment team at the UK Trade and Investment in London. So my, my position in London. Um, at uh, British Deputy High Commissioner in Hyderabad, India, and Bangalore, India, as well as positions in Armenia and Saudi Arabia and Vice Consul in Paris. Um, so thank you both for joining us this evening as we learn more about your countries, your experiences in Texas, and your country's relationship with Texas. And just to put this a little bit more in context, um, Texas, ranks as the country's number one exporter for 21 years in a row. And that's thanks to the partnership with our top trading partner um, of Mexico and our trade with the United Kingdom. And Texas also ranks as the United States' number one location for foreign direct investment. And we'll get into that uh, in a minute as well. So to start off, let's talk about your consular offices. And a lot of people don't know what the difference is between an embassy and a consul. Um, so, Bob, uh, Consul Marentes, let's start with you. The difference between the embassy and the consul and the duties you provide. I've uh, established that on the um, quantity of fun that we can have <laughs> doing the job. And I think embassies are not so <laughs> so happy <laughs> as we consuls are. So uh, this is I, Pablo Marentes. Uh, I have been in the consular and in the uh, diplomatic part of uh, some positions uh, my uh, government has uh, told me to perform and I had gladly done them, although uh, my age was not appropriate for that. I was too old. <laughs> so here I am, and uh, you can do anything about me. <laughs> <laughs> and I will uh, happily uh, yell for that and try to answer very seriously on whatever you try to strike <laughs> to me at any time. It's a privilege to be in this wonderful university. I first uh, knew about this university because I had the privilege that a brother of mine uh, reserved at the house of the uh, physical, physical education head, and please don't be bothered by this, of Texas A&M. <laughs> <laughs> so here I am. You can do after that anything you want to do with me and I will be glad to perform whatever you want. <laughs> I have done uh, uh, many visits to this uh, part of the world which I have seen growing. I knew uh, the area when uh, this city was no city. It was just uh, a nice place to come 
sometimes uh, uh, as a uh, uh, as a nice way to spend time looking at nature. And uh, I lived with a couple uh, which was a very uh, unusual couple. She was beautiful, beautiful, and the man that was married to him was a real athlete and he commanded the uh, physical education department at that time uh, uh, in the school, which was uh, uh, the very, very uh, no, well-known um, educational institution in Texas and maybe also in uh, this continent that uh, attracted a lot of uh, pupils from many other uh, countries in this hemisphere. So one of my great thoughts, permanent thinking, uh, is the experience that I had here since I was 10 years old. I used to live in the house of the man that was possible to train a very good swimmer for the uh, 1938 uh, Olympics in Germany. And he was something that uh, the real Tarzan would have uh, <laughs> would have wanted to be, but that was impossible. Uh, the man that I'm talking about defeated in the 1938 Olympics uh, in breaststroke and uh, also, the other one that you, you use your two, two arms in order to conduct you to, to the uh, finishing of the race. Freestyle? Yeah. Yeah. That's, right. that's it. I think that's what it is. I don't know. I'm not a swimmer. <laughs> so uh, I think I am a, a little part of the citizenship. Citizen, citizen, of uh, Texas, because my brother and I lived here some years, some years ago. Well, we accept you as a Texan. We, we, we make you ambassador will, of Texas. I, I would be happy <laughs> <laughs> to, to wear all the hats you did to tell me and wear <laughs> the kind of clothing it's necessary to achieve that great honor. Absolutely, absolutely. After this, I, I thank you so very much for the opportunity <laughs> of uh, uh, letting me talk and share these uh, unforgettable moments which I am spending now or living now with you as a moderator and you also as one of the uh, uh, men of uh, uh, knowledge to make a wonderful relationship with the country that you are sent. Thank you, Consul. You. <laughs> Thank you so very much yes. for having me here. Consul Hyde. So um, just like in Texas, when people think about Washington, they, they sigh inwardly. Uh, we do the same. So the embassy is in Washington. The embassy is, is the formal representation of the whole country to the whole country. Um, and we in the UK, United Kingdom, we split the United States up into, into chunks. Um, I, obviously, I have the best bit, uh, the bit where uh, uh, the people uh, are instinctively friendly and warm and welcoming towards the UK, uh, where I have way too much fun. Uh, I'm, I'm never in my office, which my, which my staff are really grateful for. Um, but it's a big region. But, so, so a consul general basically is the ambassador's representative 
in a region of a country. Um, but the, the, the challenges that you have in the United States between federal and state exists in, in diplomacy as well. So one of my challenges as I've been here is to, is to understand uh, Texans, uh, which is kind of hard. Um, <laughs> the accent sometimes throws me as well. Uh, but Austin is not Dallas. Dallas is not Fort Worth. Fort Worth is not San Antonio, and San Antonio is not Houston. And none of those are Midland or Odessa or El Paso or, or <laughs> Texarkana or Kilgore or all the other weird... Oh, what is it? Not weird, sorry. Interesting places I've been to. Unique. 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 Thank you. They're all unique. So, so what I've learned very quickly is that there's no such thing... There's no such thing as, as, a, as, a, as a typical Texan. Lots of different Texans. And I only understand that by getting out and driving around and, and visiting as many places as I can. I have a colleague of mine who, who has me on the road every summer, because only mad dogs and Englishmen go out in the, in the August weather to drive around Texas. Um, but last year, two years ago, we went all up and down the border. We went, I drove up to Midland, Odessa, El Paso, all the way down to, to Boca Chica, and then... Uh, Corpus Christi back to back to Houston, and this year we were doing a, a similar trip up East Texas. We went up to Kilgore, uh, where my colleague's father played football for the high school. Was she was more of a celebrity than I was? Then we went over to up to Nagadoshes, Texarkana, and we went all the way up to Wichita Falls, which I've had to learn to pronounce properly. Um, and then the Queen died, so I had to drive all the way back again. So we still have the Panhandle to do. But the reason I tell you all of that is that when I talk to my colleagues in Washington. They just don't understand. They don't understand what I'm talking about. I'm speaking a foreign language to them. Um, and that's the challenge in diplomacy that we have, is to explain to people life exists beyond the Beltway. And life exists in abundance. It's vibrant. It's economically spectacular. We talk, we've been talking. In, we had a parliamentary delegation here last week driving around. We were in uh, Houston, Austin, uh, Fort Worth, Dallas. They kept getting this message, the Texas miracle, and it is a miracle. It's a miracle of growth. It's a miracle of ingenuity. It's incredibly impressive. Um, and it's only by bringing people here and showing them around can they understand why I get so enthusiastic and excited about Texas and why I am the most annoying person to work with because I talk about Texas and the other states too all the time. Not but really the other states. I, I, when I, I'll be in Oklahoma next week. I'll be talking a lot about Oklahoma. Yeah. But, but, the, but the reality is, is that all of these states are interesting, but Texas is the big beast. It's, it's a huge economy, 2.4 trillion GDP. It's added the economy of a large country in the last three or four years. Its growth rates uh, you know, in double digits, which are not seen in developing countries. Developing countries do not grow at 10% a year. Texas is growing faster than all of the developing countries in the world. It, it, is, it is an economic miracle, and in no small part to the work that Adriana is doing in promoting Texas as, a, as, as an investment destination. But all that, again, said to explain that my colleagues in Washington, other than the ambassador who gets it, don't really understand that. And my colleagues in the UK don't really understand it. So I always, I always enjoy when I'm sitting with a, with a colleague from Mexico, because for Mexicans, Texas is the most important state in the United States. But British people think in terms of two coasts. And so my job here is to explain to them that it's all about the third coast. It's all about the, 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 the Sun Belt, and two thirds of the Sun Belt is Texas. And they need to come here to understand the future of America, the future of the demographics of America, and the future of the economy of America. And so the more we bring them over, the more we show them some good Texas hospitality, put a hat on, get some boots on, enjoy some two-stepping, just for fun. But and the have some we, barbecue. The, well, I, I don't ever get into conversations about barbecue because oh, my Lord. colleague from Kansas City insists that's where barbecue that's wrong. is from. Wrong. No, I, I don't want. I don't want to call her out. She, maybe she should stand Who up and identify is? herself. You can argue with her later. <laughs> but um, but I've learned one thing. I've learned in Texas is never. People always ask me, where can you get the best taco? Very dangerous conversation. Very dangerous. And where is the best barbecue? Also. Very dangerous conversation. Right. And the third conversation, which my, my, my colleague touched on, is what's your college football team? Now, I, I have a confession to make. The very first trip I did in my first week in this job, and, this, and in the art of diplomacy, I'm neither an artist nor diplomatic when I tell you this story. Um, my first trip was to, was to Oklahoma. Um, naively, Govern, Governor Stitt got me on my first day in the job and said to me, do you have a college team? I said, no, I said, it has to be OU. I came, I came back to the office very proud of my OU badge. 
didn't, didn't end well. Didn't end well. And certainly you, doesn't end well. You know this where time. you are, right? I know exactly where I am. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping you're going to defend me. <laughs> but anyway, I, you know, I, I've, I've been converted. I've been converted back to having no college teams. But that's just a way of saying <laughs> it's too dangerous. Even high school, high school is even worse. Um, but all that to say that you could, you've got to really get under the skin uh, of, of the people that you're working with. And I've worked in lots of countries around the world. It's the first country I've lived in where the first language kind of is the same. Um, and it makes it so much easier to, to understand people, to communicate with people, to get to know people, to break bread with people, and to figure out that what you see on the TV, what you hear in the news, what you read on social media, doesn't reflect what is fundamentally an incredibly hospitable community here in Texas. They look a little different from place to place. They sound a little different from place to place. They believe a little different from place to place, but there are some fundamental values that underpin everyone in Texas, and they're the values that my country likes to share. Excellent, thank you. Well, just a little fun fact for, for the audience. You mentioned the, the Texas Miracle, $2.4 trillion GDP. Uh, last quarter, um, the Texas economy grew at 7%, which is not, not only larger than developing countries, but larger than the United States as a whole. So, fun fact, you can say you learned a lot from these guys, and that's another fact that you've learned. Um, and and Consul Hyde, you talked about your tour of Texas, which I think you called Britfest. Was it Britfest? No? No, it was the Mad Dogs and Englishman tour. Okay. Britfest was a big party we had in Austin for the start of the session. Got it. Session. That's right. That's right. So you did your tour of Texas. You have not finished. You have learned a lot. Um, what surprised you as you went out and, and explored Texas? I think diversity. I think when you think about diversity in Texas, you think about the growth of the Hispanic population and how you know it's the biggest single voting block within within the state. You think about the the relative youth, uh, young population in Texas. I mean, that's what, when you think about diversity, that's what you think about racial and ethnic diversity. But actually, it's not. It's the mindset. There is a very different mindset, and I mentioned it a minute ago. You know. I, when I'm in Dallas, I talk about Dallas-Fort Worth. When I'm in Fort Worth, I talk about Fort Worth and Dallas. You've got to be very careful because the, the people are very different. You know, Cowtown is not the big D. They're very different cities. And uh, it's that diversity. I mean, I mentioned before, there were some fundamental principles that, that run right through like steel rods in a building, right through Texas. You know, the beliefs in liberty, freedom, democracy, all those things that we cherish. But there's a little subtle differences from place to place. And I never make assumptions when I'm, it's one very important lesson is never make assumptions when you drive into a town. I was, I'll tell a story. I always tell stories. Uh, I was in a Walmart gas station in the middle of nowhere in my white Jaguar with the, with the, uh, Union flag, the British flag, painted on the sides with a 20-foot trailer on the back that I was that pulled 2,000 miles from, from Houston. First of all, you know, nobody in Texas can understand why I would pull a trailer in an SUV, but anyway, I was. Um, and there's a lady, a lady of a certain age pulled up next to me. There's two, two pumps. She was facing me in a beaten up old uh, station wagon with holes in the back. And she got out and she was a, she was a large lady of a, probably about 75. And she was wearing some kind of really um, lame pajamas. Um, and she put $5 into her car and she went to the, to the pump and came back again. And she looked at me and I thought, what's she going to say? She says, I love your country got in a car and drove away and I'm thinking this is in the middle of nowhere so Texans you know I never make assumptions so everyone's a little bit different and you know I, I've really enjoyed celebrating those differences I've driven around and uh, you know sometimes you can you can go to a country or you can go to a state or you can go to a city and you can assume that you understand what's going on there and I can live here for probably 50 years and never quite understand what's happening and what's making people tick in Texas. But what I do know is it's good. Excellent. Well, good. Great answer. Um, yeah. And Consul Marentes, uh, Mexico is such an important partner to Texas. Our, our number one trade partner uh, with 285 billion total in trade uh, between Texas and Mexico. And Mexico's a top destination for investment from Texas companies. And we're also home to significant investment from Mexican companies. So the, the relationship with Texaco, with, with um, Texaco, I, I literally said that, <laughs> Mexico and Texas um, is, is familial, it's cultural, it's economic, 
Can you ex talk to us a little bit about the importance of this relationship between Texas and Mexico? First of all, I must say that uh, I must make a correction. Oh. A correction on the way you call uh, both countries at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> it's we were uh, trying to establish that the best way to refer to both countries, it was Mextex. <laughs> Mextex because it sounds like a tortilla mix. <laughs> it's very uh, uh, healthy to eat tortillas uh, and uh, have a taste of them when you put some of that wonderful meat that uh, only uh, Mexican cooks, our wives, <laughs> can make in a taco. I, I, I certainly will if I ever can afford to make a, a, a wonderful meeting with you and inviting you. Uh, I will give you thin tacos, very thin ones, but very tasty very tasty, and you will see another uh, facet of Mexico. Mexico is the expert of making tacos. So you so must I think, be aware of that. The, the diplomacy at work. I, I think the answer to where are the best tacos is Mexico. Absolutely. <laughs> I, think, I think we can agree on that. So. Or, or Consul Marentes' house, maybe. <laughs> Uh, I, 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 I ate the first tacos in my life uh, when I went to a, a very nice small school which was standing at the top of a, a hill and you can see the whole campus of Texas A&M and the, the uh, school that I was going to go. It was uh, Texas A&M Consolidated High School. So there were no, uh, there were no uh, hesitation in telling that the uh, authorities, the academic authorities of uh, Texas A&M were preparing to receive a lot of Mexicans when somebody at the uh, school board said, I don't think we should have uh, all those Mexicans here. What we will do with the guys that need the higher education? Why don't we <laughs> dismiss all the Mexicans so we can count with another many, many other spaces for Americans to study. So uh, the great, uh, great uh, part of students at the uh, uh, of at the A &M, uh, had to move to a small ranch uh, nearby here, and that was the second ranch that they were going to have. Now that same entity of uh, real uh, people that love to cultivate the land, they never uh, forgot what the Mexicans could do in uh, putting the uh, small uh, pepitas, small uh, things that will grow very quickly. Seeds, 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 seeds. seeds. So uh, they established nearby another small Texas A&M. And it was a wonderful school after the new authorities of Texas A&M 
saw what Mexicans could do by themselves, they brought them back to Texas A&M. And we Mexicans were very proud of it. And we are still, because uh, to come to school in a part that was Mexico some time ago, it was very comforting that uh, the Texan territory would not be closed for Mexicans anymore. So it was a, a great experience we had. And since then, I see when the uh, uh, relationships of uh, the Mexican, uh, the Mexican Aggies, I would say, because we have two or three uh, uh, agricultural and mechanical colleges in Mexico now, following the model of uh, Texas A&M. Uh, and it was great when everybody saw that if not in any other way, but in the teaching of how to uh, grow things in the earth for the uh, uh, keeping good health in a, a place which being healthy was something rather of a miracle. But uh, since we are doing this, uh, not uh, uh, a big uh, happening that two countries are working all the time for themselves, you don't have to do anything else. You don't have to announce that we live together, almost together. And many of Mexicans come here. And although they're sometimes uh, being told, why don't you go back to Mexico? You have many opportunities. And he said, we need the airplanes, we need the boats, and everything else to transport. And we, if we use all that, and you see that you can be also well nourished by the way we cultivate land, this will be, again, something that brings us together. And that's the lesson I have had. And that's why I was very, very uh, satisfied not being sent to one of the sophisticated, very sophisticated uh, populations on the earth, or even in the United States. We were all together, just one uh, a great piece of humanity getting together in order to have a surplus of production. And whenever we need to send something to a starving nation, we can do that. And that's the way we think, Mexicans think. That's what the agriculture practice is done. Mm -hmm. We can feed the world, both countries, without trying to be hostile one to the other. That's my lesson, <laughs> and I will never be tired of telling this uh, small story of how cooperation between two powerful countries. Texas is really a, almost an independent country, I would say. <laughs> and Mexico is also <laughs> uh, gaining, ag again, independence from Texas. It's another way now. Not Texas against Mexico, but Mexico against Texas, OK? And I'm very proud of that. We are all friends. If you would uh, listen to the way we Mexicans, us Mexicans are received at the house of the Americans living in the nice places 
of the big, 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 the biggest, the biggest political uh, entity uh, in the world being a good acquaintance with one of the uh, uh, countries that was privileged in order to, uh, uh, that, to live nearby that country and getting so many other things that have been usual and very, very nourishing for our country. That cooperation and collaboration is, is so important. Um, and I'm originally from Laredo, mm. from uh, the border, and that relationship between Texas and Mexico is, is foundational to so many of the um, economies of the communities um, along along the border from El Paso to, to Brownsville. So thank you for that story. Thank you. Um, Consul Hyde, when you did your tour of Texas, and I was following you on LinkedIn as you were going uh, across the, the state, uh, community to community, and you had to cut it short uh, because of the unfortunate passing of um, Her Majesty the Queen, which we all the world and the country um, really mourned uh, with with you and, and your fellow countrymen. Um, and we are now uh, getting ready, well, we not we, but you all are getting ready for a historic occasion, uh, which is the coronation of the, the new monarch. Can you tell us about that? What is, what is happening with that? And it's a two-part question, but Tell me um, how that is is going in in your country and what you all are doing in preparation for that. Yeah, it's um, it's going to be an interesting uh, month of May uh, for both in the UK but also all around the world. So we're obviously we're all going to be celebrating in in, in different ways. We're going to do it in a Texas style, of course, uh, which means it's going to be bigger than everybody else's. Um, <laughs> So we, so yeah, the the coronation. Uh, my mum, my mother is eighty three, and she was I think eleven when when we last had a coronation. Um, she just about remembers it. Uh, but what what's really struck me, uh, both in the passing of Her Majesty and also in the last few months and now for the coronation, is the incredible uh, depth of interest and understanding in Texas of the UK, which is part of the, part of our problem is that. You know, we're not that interesting a country for Texans because they kind of know us pretty well already. We're not as exciting as, as, a, as a country that you've never visited or you, ne you don't know much about. So the outpouring of, uh, of affection uh, when Her Majesty passed was, 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 it was incredible and really moving. I mean, w my team and I, you know, we opened a condolence book, which is fairly typical at the consulate in, in Houston. But then we had a huge level of interest in Austin, um, and the Secretary of State said, "Yeah, come along. Open my office. You can use my office. We can we can do a condolence book there." So we opened the book here in, in Austin for the day, and it was it was swamped. And then we said, "Well, let's go to Dallas as well." And the Mayor of Dallas opened an office there, and people came from far and wide. Almost all Americans, almost all Texans. We had a few from Louisiana, a few from Oklahoma, but and I was thinking, why would? Why would people do this? This didn't make any sense to me. Um, then, of course, I got another phone call say, from, uh, from from President Bush saying he would like to sign a condolence book. So I had to drive back to Dallas, and he and Mrs. Bush signed the book as well, which was a really big moment as well for us, and be some beautiful messages. Um, if anyone's ever met President Bush, some great stories about his encounters uh, with, with the Queen as well, all of which were funny, all of which his mother... Uh, was not impressed with, um, so you know he told me all these stories. It was a, it was a really uplifting moment that everybody from from regular folks who just happened to be in Austin and wanted to sign a book, through to the former presidents who specifically wanted to sign a book. There was a kind of right across Texas, people were really interested in, in the life and the passing of Her Majesty, and that's continued through to the coronation. So sixth of May is a big day in the UK. It's a formal religious ceremony, the, the coronation. It's, it's all about anointing with oils, very similar to a baptism or in, you know, a Catholic or Christian baptism. It's, it's, so it's a religious ceremony, and it's about passing of the baton, literally. It's a, there's, a, there's an orb of office, uh, there's a, and there's a crown, of course, as well. And so that's going to be a big formal ceremony. But the king has been very clear. He also wants 
there to be community elements of this as well. So uh, we're having this big day on Monday in the UK. It's a public holiday in the UK. Sadly, it's not a public holiday for my team. Um, I'm making them all work. Um, but, it's, um, uh, but it's a public holiday in the UK, and everybody has been encouraged to go out to volunteer and to contribute in some way to their community. So in that spirit, on, on, on Jubilee, on, on Coronation Day itself, we're going to have a big party in the evening, which, of course, as Brits, we like to have a good party. Uh, with music and dancing and all the fun and festivities. But in the morning, we're going to work with the, uh, the Buffalo Bayou uh, Foundation in Houston. And we're get gathering schools from right across Houston, uh, from all the different parts of the town. Uh, we've got uh, junior organizations. We've got seniors organizations. We've got all kinds of people come together. We're all going to put on our boots and we're going to go out and we're going to clean up the bayou. And that's going to be the big, you know, for, for a couple of hours in the morning, hopefully not too hot, hopefully not raining, hopefully not a storm. But we're going to go out there and we're going to just put some back into the community so the coronation for us is about celebrating this thousand year old ritual of passing on the leadership um, and also it's about remembering where we are where we're from where we live now and how we need to give back to our community so the king has been very very clear that's what he wants us to do have some fun but give back as well and that kind of resonates with my experience of texas as well people you know, the United States is very different from the UK in many respects. One respect is it's much more individualistic, much, much, much less, you know, it's more about, you know, personal ambition and being able to deliver and success is everything. Whereas in the UK, we, we tend to celebrate failure a little bit more. Um, you know, we kind of enjoy a good loser, uh, which is probably why Ted Lasso is so popular. Um, but, um, you know, we, we, so we, we, we are a little bit different. But one thing we do understand is that when times are tough, communities matter, and we need to remember who, who, where we come from and give back to those people as well. And so that's why when I, you know, we pitched the idea around our team, we had a huge uptake from the team. But as we've gone into the churches, into schools, into community, everyone's like, yeah, what a great idea. What a great way of, of being part of this by actually just doing something for the community as well. So, so yeah, it's going to be fun. The, uh, and the way you described it is, is really um, compelling because it's the first coronation in many lifetimes, right? Like many of us alive today have no, have known no other uh, monarch of the United Kingdom other than Queen Elizabeth. And I read somewhere, someone said, you know, to, to you all, she was your queen, but to the rest of the world, she was the queen. Mm -hmm. Like the, right, only queen, you know, well, there are other queens, but um, uh, anyway, it was uh, a, Really interesting, and, and um, uh, thank you for for sharing that and, and what the plan is, because I think it's something that that's very um, interesting. And I want to be mindful of time, and I, I wanted to open it up to the audience to see if anybody has any questions um, that they wanted to ask the consuls. Yes, sir. Yes, I'm just curious. I wish you'd asked me that about Texas. I could have. Said, I've got a few books I could have recommended. <laughs> I mean, the, the, it's, it's a bit of an easy and a bit of a pat answer. If I if I could think about it a bit more, I could probably come up with a better idea. But there's various there's various biographies of Churchill and uh, that you could read, which gives a sense of. Um, and I was listening to a podcast as I was driving over from Dallas earlier, and they were talking about World War II and how basically Britain was on its knees. It was almost bankrupt. It was running out of pilots. It was running out of the ability to fight uh, the Luftwaffe. There were bombs, bombers over London every night. But yet, the indomitable spirit of, of, of a single man with the ability to communicate just kept the nation going. And I think it's that spirit of, you know, I, I joked before about, you know, we celebrate losers. We do celebrate losers. We, we know, we, we, participation is, is important to us. Um, winning is not everything. But losing is not possible and i think you know when i think about ukraine now and people ask me why the uk is so passionate about the defense of ukraine is because you cannot accept uh, uh, defeat in those terms and, and that sort of spirit that under, under, underpins the country that's the steel backbone uh, that comes through in any any good biography of churchill and there were several out there but you get a sense of what what the uk is about you know you had his faults we all have our faults the uk is certainly not perfect in in history um you know but warts and all faults and all uh, that spirit is what what defines the country consul marentes a book about mexico that would highlight for for people what the the true spirit of mexico is that how you 
Where did it, Steve? The character, the character of Mexico. I really wanted to, to recommend one single book which will give you uh, an idea of what Mexico is now. But um, somebody told me that in that book there were many other things which are left out. Why? I don't know. Uh, but uh, there are some other books which I call virgin books because they are exactly as they were written. No additions, no, no uh, bad treatment or anything. And uh, I certainly would like to send, uh, I don't know to what uh, collective address, uh, giving you uh, 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 four or five uh, titles of books, and maybe uh, I could uh, invest some of uh, my very scarce money <laughs> <laughs> in sending you the collection of three books which are trying to, uh, I will uh, let, uh, one of my my appreciated friends at the at the uh, consulate, if you can receive my my uh, uh, the titles of the three books I'm I'm thinking of, and uh, try to let them uh, have being have by by the people that wanted to know a little bit more about. Uh, economics, theater, fun in Mexico. Thank you. Just, I just remember a book, actually, it's one very, very good book that you must read if you haven't read it. It's by Bill Bryson. It's called Tales from a Small Island. So this is an American who lived in the UK for many years, writes about the UK. It's not necessarily flattering about the UK. But it's a great encapsulation of all the quirkiness that, that, that makes us the odd, the odd country that we are. And Consul Hyde, I'm curious, did you say you, there's a list of books about Texas that you would recommend? Yes, I, I, I was given a long list of books to read before I came here. They, oh. didn't, they didn't all say the same thing, so it was slightly confusing. But I read it. It's a God Save Texas um, by an author from Austin, actually, um, which was a brilliant book, which taught me all I needed to know, and then I came here and learned everything else. Um, but I've learned a lot since I've been here. Excellent. Another question? If not, I have more questions. I have, I have more questions. Yes, yes, ma'am. Um, one for each of you. One for Adriana. Why has the Governor's Cup, why has Texas been awarded the Governor's Cup 11 years in a row? I think you have a lot to do with that, but I'll let you answer that question. Oh, well, that, that uh, for, for folks that don't know, the Governor's Cup is the award that goes to the state with the most economic development projects in the country. And last year, our team tracked over a thousand relocation and expansion projects in the state that um, created about 60,000 jobs um, and $40 billion of capital investment. Um, and the, the reason for that is, um, Many, right? The the business climate that we have, the reasonable regulatory environment, the economic resiliency that that Consul Hyde was was referring to, um, companies are looking at the state as a potential for um, investment. Uh, the workforce that we have, and I know we have the uh, workforce uh, commission commissioner for employers, um, Commissioner Demerson, uh, with us. Um, but the the workforce that we have, the diverse population, um, young population, uh, that uh, employers are, are looking for, fast-growing state. Um, so many, many reasons. Um, but I think also uh, in the state of Texas, economic development is a team sport. And we work with our local community partners um, across the state of Texas with our state agency partners like the Workforce Commission, the Department of Transportation, and of course we work with our consular partners 
to help get the word out about Texas. And, and so that's one of the reasons, thank you for the question, but one of the reasons why I was so interested in um, and honored to moderate the panel with the two of you because both are such important um, partners in our economic growth and in our economic story. So, and that, so that was my question, but now you have a question for them. Well, Council Hyde, I know that uh, during the pandemic, one of the, when we came out of it, one of the first visits from the UK to the United States was your trade minister to Texas. And I, I wonder if you could expound on the reason for that. It kind of helped that Texas was open first, um, so he, so he, so yeah, they could travel. But but it also goes. I mean, we spent we spent eighteen months in the pandemic on endless Zoom calls and team uh, teams calls, and we're depressed as anybody else. But it was actually a phenomenal opportunity because, as you mentioned earlier, this is a pretty big state and a pretty big region. So actually, flying around and driving around is 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 it takes time. Um, but actually, COVID allowed me to get out virtually into different communities. So before we did our road trips, we actually did a whole series of virtual visits to, we did to the Rio Grande Valley, we did to, to, to the Borderplex region, I did some into uh, Oklahoma, into Arkansas, into Louisiana, into New Mexico, and into with, with Dallas, Fort Worth, you know, all, all, every, everywhere you can think of in Texas, we reached out and we had a whole series of meetings in one day with mayors and uh, local economic development agencies, with various universities and citizens groups and all kinds of different people that I would never normally get to meet if I had to drive there and back because it's far. So it, COVID was an opportunity and that helped us build up a huge amount of knowledge, uh, most of which I then immediately forget, but my colleagues thankfully are cleverer than me. And we were able then to translate that into a pitch. So you know, Adriana will you know, massively understates the incredible success that Texas has had. I mean, the numbers that she quotes are just mind-blowing. They're bigger than many big, big economies around the world. So what the success of the economic development here is, is incredible. But we're able then to translate that into, into bite-sized chunks for our ministers to explain to them, where do you need to go to? And, it, and Texas was, we warmed them up so much in COVID that they were itching to come as soon as, as soon as they could. As I say, it also helped, you know, Los Angeles and New York were not open, so, so we were able to get them to Texas. But, but they, they came here, and now the problem, challenge we now have is we can't stop them coming. Every bit. I, was, I had the group last week, I've got a group this week, I've got a group next week. And it's non-stop active action now because everyone's now woken up to the fact that if you want to do business, if you want to succeed, if you want to have fun, come to Texas. And unfortunately, we, we are now victims of your and our own success. Um, so, yeah, that, that's why they came, and that's why they won't stay away. I'll take it. I'll take it. All right. Any any other question? Yes, sir. Um, can, you, can you talk a little bit about how you think of the differently between trade and investment, right? Uh, pandemic, global supply chain for all, you know, front some very challenged trade, but that isn't necessarily the same thing as investment. Um, I'm kind of curious how you think about that as a, you know, someone trying to develop to be honest, you know, in the UK we are instinctive free traders, so we don't distinguish. Uh, so I'm as happy to see a UK company set up in Texas as I am to see a Texas company set up in the UK. So many countries think in terms of export promotion and foreign direct investment promotion. They don't like their companies to move because that's exporting jobs in a very naive and, and, and narrow interpretation. We don't care about that. We just want trade to flow in two directions. Now, we're, we're blessed because we have so much overseas investment in the UK that we have a balance of payments deficit. So we quite like the idea of our companies going overseas, being successful, and then repatriating wealth. But a lot of countries don't do that. A lot of countries are instinctively protectionist. They don't like their companies moving abroad because it takes jobs with them. So for us... COVID was, was, it was difficult for, for two reasons. One is the other supply chain crunch that you mentioned. So things ground to a halt, demand ground to a halt, so the, the supply chains in, in Asia in particular ground to a halt. And there was a massive global uncertainty in the, economic, in, in the, in the, in the markets as well. So investment decisions ground to a halt as well. But in addition to that in the UK, of course, we had Brexit, which which we officially triggered during COVID, so we had a had to completely change our supply chain uh, and, and our, our, the way we engage in trade in our nearest market in the European Union. So we had a you know it's a double whammy, I think is the expression. We were triple whammy. We were we were facing challenges all around, but but I think we just focused entirely, extensively, and completely 
on promoting the idea that trade is good, that protectionism is bad, that barriers are bad, and we focused around how do we just get our companies to talk to companies here. And as I said a minute ago, it's a very simplistic answer, but I said it a minute ago, if you put companies in touch with each other, if you can get them to communicate, then they will do business. Now, two years ago, three years ago, the idea of a company doing an end-to-end -end contract overseas in the United States, even less chance in India or Sub-Saharan Africa or, or Latin America, but even in the United States, a company doing an end-to-end -end business contract for a major export or a major financial partnership without meeting was unheard of. That would never have happened. It happens all the time now. So the way we do business has changed. Companies will do virtual business in a way that they wouldn't do before. So the, to the, so the pandemic was a major challenge to us. It's still, our economy is still hurting on the back of it. Recovery has been tough for us. But, but what we've now seen is a change in the way people do business. People are much more trusting of technology and they're doing business remotely. So we focused on putting people in a virtual room. And then you'll be, I think you'll be glad to hear this. I see the role of government is to put people in the room and then get the hell out of the room and leave them to it. And that's what we do. And we do that all the time. And I, you know, I'm, I was, I, I was, you know, half the size and a complete black hair when I arrived here. I just travel endlessly and endlessly and endlessly to find the people here to put in their room with Brits and then get out of the way and let them do business. And that's what we found virtually during COVID made it much, much easier to do that. And now it's, I'm back on the road again. It's much more difficult, but fundamentally, we just generated huge volumes of relationships and many more of those relationships are bearing fruit. And so we're seeing... Lots, every, every few, three or four days I have a call, there's a new British company opening in Texas somewhere, can I come and take part? So from a trade and investment standpoint, our number one trading, Texas is the number one exporting state in the United States, and the number one trading partner is right here, Mexico. Texas is also the number one location for foreign direct investment in the United States, and the number one source of FDI is sitting right over there. So critically important, right, the, the trade side and the foreign direct investment side, and we see it the same way. It is a, it is a two-way street. If a Texas company is exporting products in Mexico or in Europe, and they decide to open a facility in Mexico or Europe, that is a win for us because they're just growing their business. They're expanding their business, and that's a success for, for everybody. So I know we're out of time, but we have a gentleman with a question. So please. Yeah, quick question. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, uh, in regards to the Texas economy, we talk about the GDP growth. Um, in your respective roles, are there specific concerns or expectations with the current macroeconomic environment, um, specifically uh, rising inflation, um, countries deciding to remove away from the dollar being the reserve currency, and then this new tech of cryptocurrency and central bank digital currencies. Are there specific concerns or expectations given the, the current environment? I, I can have a stab at that. I mean, the answer is yes to all of the above. Um, we, we were afraid of all of those things. The, the biggest fear I have, and it's not a Texas-specific thing, it's a, it's a, this, is, this happened in the, in the 2008 financial crash as well, where politicians and legislators are not nimble and informed enough or expert enough to make the changes that need to be made to cope with a new and evolving economy. So the economy now is different to the economy three years ago. The global economy has changed. It doesn't look anything like, um, and it's going to change again, whether it be through crypto and the use of Bitcoin or or moving from a from a, to a yuan based you know central currency. By the way, we've been talking about that for 30 years. I don't really think that's going to happen. Um, but 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 the reality is is that my biggest fear, and this is, and I think I think in Texas it's a little more nimble. But uh, but in my own country and across the European Union, uh, in 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 countries uh, in in, the, in the, the big developing economies in India and China and people not responding quickly enough and uh, and aggressively enough to meet the new demands. And the biggest challenge, the biggest outcome of that failure will be a growing uh, a growing uh, size of the, the well, the, the rich will get much, much richer and the poor will get much, much poorer. And that, that, that kind of, the, 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 the way we measure success in GDP doesn't tell the whole story. You know, we're all very mindful of the fact that 
you know, we've spent 30 years since the 1990s pulling millions of people out of poverty across, across the world. There is a risk that if we, if we don't respond adequately enough to the changes in the economy globally and domestically, is that some of those people will slip back into poverty in our own countries, but in sub-Saharan Africa, in Latin America, and other, other parts of the world. So the global south is at risk if we don't get this right, and that's a big global concern for all of us. All right, thank you. Um, I believe it's 7.30, where is it? Are we uh, good to take one more question, or are we wrapped? Oh my gosh, there's three questions. Are we good? <laughs> Normally people are asleep by this well, time with me. Well, uh, and I thought, you know, well, they've got cocktails in their hands, so I think they're, uh, it's making it all, um, anyway, yes, please, go ahead. Interesting question. So, so my, my role in Latin America is I was based initially in, in Caracas, in Venezuela, but then I moved because of challenges of working there and, and moving around to, 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 to Costa Rica, two very different countries. Probably is probably the two most different countries I've ever had the pleasure of ever working in. Um, my role was uh, I, I, re I ran our trade and investment operations for the, for the UK government across the Caribbean and Central America, and I also covered the northern part of, of, of South America, so you know, Colombia, Ecuador, uh, as well as Venezuela. Um, the, the, the key difference between that and Texas is scale. Uh, international trade is, is very, very difficult unless you can immediately access a, scale, a scalable market. It's if you, the vast majority of international trade is done by small and medium-sized companies. Um, they do not have the cap the capital or the capacity or the labor or the or the, or the time to, to be experimental, and so you need a scalable market quickly. Uh, most of those economies, uh, obviously Colombia is a Colombia, Venezuela in, in, in theory are bigger, but Panama, Costa Rica, the Carib the Caribbean islands. They have to have a very, very unique opportunity to be able to go and do good business there. Whereas in Texas, you can almost do anything because every sector is available and there's a 30 million, 32 million uh, population here now. With a, you know, we mentioned $2.4 trillion economy. It's also a relatively wealthy state. It's a relatively young state. Young people like to spend money on interesting things. So if you've got almost any product or service, you can do it. You can sell it in 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 Texas, if you you know if you're smart enough to go to the right part of the, the state, India is a very very different thing. 1.3 billion people, 650 million people live in abject poverty, so there's no market there at all for for most products. Um, there's about a 250 to 300 million middle class, um, so it's very very large economy still to to be able to do business in, but it's incredibly bureaucratic. It's incredibly slow. The legal system takes years and years and years to resolve anything. So if you're an IP-rich company, it's very difficult to do business there because if your IP is stolen, in theory, you can, you can get rep recompense, but it'll take 30 years. Who's going to wait 30 years? So it's a challenging environment to work in, but the, but the gains are, are spectacular if you can do it. So completely different market, very small scale, very niche. Large scale, you can do everything in Texas. In India, you can do some things really, really well, but much, more, much higher risk. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we can continue our conversations over cocktails. And I want to thank um, Consul Marentes, um, Consul Hyde, uh, for your time this evening and for your expertise and for sharing your stories um, as we talk about diplomacy and culture. And we'll continue to have conversations over cocktails. So thank you all very much for joining. Thank you.